last time we um, finished with this exercise on uh, clade and based on our um, based on our understanding of the definition we defined the various excuse me the various scenarios okay we did it all together this is a clade this is a clade the tip of a phylogenetic tree or cladogram is a clade this is not a clade because there is no common ancestry between these not direct common ancestry okay eventually yes but not direct and this is not a clade because um, the, uh, the last one is excluding the last branch so uh, in summary what we talked about so far in all this uh, lecture uh, is how classification works and we have learned that the first um, we consider uh, uh, broad features uh, to classify organisms. For instance, uh, uh, we could consider simply the fact that an organism is made of one type of cell, prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. That could be one uh, determinant factor, and it is, you know, for domains. But then we zoom into more and more the details, and um, typically, historically, phylogenetic trees have been built upon uh, morphology, anatomy. But now we know that um, we have a new tool, which is the molecular tool. So we, knew, we use DNA analysis to also understand uh, if the hypothesis we came up with is correct or if we, sometimes we have to revisit it. Um, many times, in order to understand how related are uh, organisms, we look at the embryos. And whenever we talk about vertebrates, actually chordates, which is the broad group to which we belong, uh, we'll see that in order to define chordates, again, we belong to that, we look at characteristics that are present in the embryo, not necessarily in adulthood. Did you know you have a tail? Of course, you have a tail, right? You have a tail when you are an embryo, then it disappears. But you have a tail when you are an embryo. So that is a characteristic, uh, one of the characteristics, as we will see, of chordates, okay? Did you know that you have gills as well? That one you didn't know. <laughs> yes, you have gills. Very beginning of your embryonic development. You are a little fish, okay? We'll look at all this. So sometimes we look at embryos to define characteristics and to do phylogenesis. And so uh, we can construct morphological, anatomical uh, trees or molecular trees. And um, we can see if, the, if uh, those overlap, sometimes overlap 100%. We'll see some examples later on in the course. Um, molecular trees sometimes are bad at uh, resolving um, species relationships that we are not totally completely sure about. Okay, so this is all that I have for um, finishing up uh, phylogenesis. And now we're going to uh, go over a little chapter. So this chapter entitled Speciation, it's not in your study guide in this sequence. I introduce it in my course because to me, it does not make any sense to move on and talk about species, 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 species without defining what a species is, okay? And maybe in your study guide, they can tell you between the lines somewhere there, but it's not presented systematically. So I, um, I like to uh, do that. It's only a few slides, okay? So we're going to talk about the definition of species and how new species arise. And we're going to watch also a video on birds, uh, examples of how new um, species of birds may arise um, pretty quickly over the course of uh, just thousands of generations. Okay, so um, the most utilized uh, concept for defining species is known as biological species concept, or you can uh, acronymize as BSC. 
uh, and uh, this was introduced by Ernst Mayer. Uh, and uh, there is an important premise here. It can only be applied to sexually reproducing organisms. If you don't reproduce sexually, this uh, concept cannot be applied to you. But we know that evolution has, fa has favored this mode of reproduction. So most of organisms on Earth, they do reproduce sexually. So we can apply this concept to most of the species on Earth. What does this, spe uh, this uh, concept imply? A uh, group of organisms belong to the same species if, if they Number one, naturally interbreed, naturally, not artificially, not forced by man, naturally. And number two, produce viable and fertile offspring. Viable means that is alive, that is able to live. But sometimes strange things happen in nature. Maybe some different species may mate, may interbreed, but maybe the offspring uh, is, uh, never develops at an embryonic level or is born but dies very, very soon. It does, is not able to live a, a life, postnatal life. Strange things happen in nature sometimes, and we'll talk about all these uh, examples that fall in a gray area, not today. When time comes, when the chapter of speciation comes, by now, we are just introducing the biological species concept. Uh, in this picture, shows you two species of birds. One is, they're both middle work, but one is Eastern, the other is Western. And uh, the female of each species does not recognize the song of the male of the other. So they look almost identical. They're just, uh, I think one has two lines, one has one line in the plumage, like you really have to zoom in and to be able to uh, be an expert, to be able to recognize which is which. Um, but bottom line, if the female uh, hears a song that is a slightly different tone, it will not mate. And therefore, no breeding. So these two are different species, okay? Even if you put them close together, they don't like each other, and therefore they don't mate. So they're different species. Sometimes weird things happen in nature. It's very close, it's a close call. But sometimes two different species sort of like each other, sort of interbreed in nature, and produce viable offspring. Offspring, they can live a normal life. But the last thing is not met. The last item I told you, fertility. If that's the case, and we know some examples like this one, I think most of you know, a female horse and a male donkey produce a mule. A mule is viable, but is infertile, doesn't reproduce. 99.9% .9 of the cases, weird things happen in nature. Biology is not math. It's not, it's never yes or no. There are also some kind of, maybe. There are some mules that have been able to re, uh, reproduce. And whenever we talk about genetics, you can understand more, yes. I think they were viable. You may want to double check on that. They were, I didn't, I don't recall reading that they had problems. And I think uh, the mule was, uh, uh, was uh, um, mated with one of the parental, not with another mule. Okay. Very rare cases. So um, again, when we talk about genetics, uh, when we talk about biology in general, there are always exceptions, always kind of strange things or exceptions that can happen in nature. So, but generally speaking, this is true, okay? Mule is infertile. And uh, can a 
a male horse and a female donkey also mate? Why do I why do I indicate there female horse with a male donkey? Yeah, she is. They can mate. So anatomically, it works. Yes, and in fact, it happens. Have you ever heard about a hini? Hini. Okay, so here's the other weird thing about this hybrid, and we will see when we zoom into this chapter. Or it's so interesting. If you change the female and the male of the species, so now if you uh, if you were to interchange where a male horse with a female donkey are uh, mated, yes, there is offspring. The offspring is a little bit different. It looks a little bit different than this one, and even we give it a different name. It's Hini in this case, and. Um, We'll see with other hybrids with uh, strange names. Anybody recalls a hybrid that is uh, heard about? There is a, fam a famous one that everybody in my classes more or less knows. Liger. Yeah, it always comes. Okay. How about a Tigon? Have you ever heard about this? So they have different names. They're the same species that we're mating, but depending if we made the uh, female of one species and the male of the other, vice versa. The hybrid looks a little different, and we, we call it a different name. And the reason why this happens is, is the following. I'm telling you very conceptually, it's, it's very complicated. There are genes that we carry with us, but on top of our genes, there is a so-called imprinting. And even if we receive two sets of chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad. Many times of these two chromosomes that I have inherited, one from mom and one from dad, theoretically identical. In reality, the one that speaks up is either the one from mom or the one from dad. Okay, let's take it this way. And therefore, if you interchange these sets of chromosomes, um, you can obtain a different uh, combination there, okay? Uh, so imprinting, in this case, um, plays a role. It's really interesting, um, I guess, uh, this phenomenon. We'll talk about them more when the times come, especially after going through the chapter of genetics, where you may understand a little bit more about these things, hopefully. Okay, for now we are defining species. Okay, these two are not the same species because they're, um, e even though if they may breed naturally, produce value of offspring, this offspring is mostly sterile. Now, another thing I want to point out is this. If this offspring was not sterile, it would make any sense because those two species that are interbreeding, most likely, they come from a phenomenon of, as we call it, speciation. Remember that bifurcation where from a common ancestor to species may arise? So how come evolution goes in a divergent way and then it would converge again? It wouldn't make any sense. If two species have arisen, it makes sense they don't go back and fuse into something else. They keep separated this way makes a lot of sense because over the course of millions of years these two species may have been reabsorbed into the hybrid very well okay so it doesn't happen that way um, in evolution okay so obviously if two organisms belong to the same species and therefore we can apply the biological species concept and its principles uh, it, it goes with it that these two organisms will have very common characteristics, right? If I'm homo sapiens, I'm homo sapiens. And there is genetic compatibility between me and another homo sapiens, interbreed under natural condition. And of course, as I told you, the biological species concept assumes that there is sexual reproduction because it's based on mating, okay? But what if I am an organism that reproduces asexually? 
I cannot apply this concept, right? Maybe there are some alternatives, okay? And we'll talk about these alternatives later on when chapter comes. Uh, there are a couple drawbacks of the biological species concepts besides the fact that we cannot apply to um, asexually reproducing organisms. These cannot, for instance, be used uh, to understand if some fossil, um, extinct um, a fossil uh, remains were belonging to the same species or not. Of course, there's no way to bring them to life and make them uh, breed to know if we're looking at the same species or not. So definitely we cannot apply it in this case. Okay, so species that reproduce is actually also is a problem. Um, the other ca um, caveat is that sometimes, for instance, uh, there are physical barriers between groups that we define the same species, uh, but in fact, these two groups may be geographically separated and never really meet with one another, okay? So, in reality, these two don't ever mate, but potentially they could mate, they're just kept separated by physical barrier. So, this can become confusing, okay? These are special situations. Now, as I told you, the process of formation of a new species is known as speciation or speciation. And um, it, it's a process um, where from an initial population of the same species of organisms, something happens and you may have two or more than two groups that uh, arise that uh, that become different species, no longer interbreed. Now, of course, when you think about this phenomena of becoming new species, we're talking about millions of years, okay? Sometimes it can be shorter, few exceptions, but generally speaking, it's millions, okay? Now, it doesn't happen so quickly, okay? And that's how all the species that we know of on Earth have occurred. So, at the, at the basis of a speciation event, there is what we call reproductive isolation. And whenever I show you a video today, please pay attention. Uh, the video really makes you visualize this concept. So, imagine that there are, uh, there is a um, population of same species of birds. And at some point, a small group of this population, for some reason, ends up on a kind of nearby but distant enough island and stays there because maybe it finds a lot of food. Why would it go on the mainland again? Maybe on the island, there's no other bird, there's no competition, all food it will stay there. So what's gonna happen to this group on the island versus the group that's on the mainland? There is a, um, reproductive barrier, there is interruption of gene flow. They don't mate with one another and mix their genes together. So this group, over the course of many, many, many generations eating different food, maybe a little different climate and so on, the environment in that regard will um, push and select for uh, traits and genes that are different from the ones in the mainland. And so maybe after millions of years, or sometimes uh, um, hundreds of thousands of years, these two groups cannot, cannot recognize each other anymore. Don't mate with each other anymore, theoretically, if they come back together, because they've accumulated too many differences. And when that, that happens, we are in front of a new species that have a rosin. Okay, so a reproductive isolation or interruption of gene flow is uh, what initially must happen or happens in an event of speciation. So gene flow between two populations, two or more, sometimes there are different groups that separate from one another, uh, is interrupted. Genetic differences accumulate over time and ultimately reproductive isolation occurs. And when, when I say reproductive isolation, I don't just mean the fact that they don't mate, 
the different species. Maybe they do mate, but they don't produce viable offspring or fertile offspring. That's all examples of reproductive isolation. Okay, as I told you, the length typically is millions of years, a few millions of year, years. Sometimes a smaller time, but it's uh, rare, and these are also estimates. Uh, typically, uh, we talk about millions of years, at least a few millions of years. Okay, so let's watch this uh, video. I don't understand why when I play a video, it doesn't come. The audio in my, um, in my videos. Maybe I can try to put this one next to the computer.
will just to give you an example okay uh, of a specific type of speciation okay so i'm done with this little section and now we're going to start um, understanding uh, the modern theory of evolution that was introduced by Charles Darwin, as you know. Okay, so evolution is uh, considered both a process and a result. And the process of evolution um, uh, focuses on all the mechanisms that affect how organisms change over time. So you can define evolution simply as change over time over time in a single individual or over, over time over the course of generations of a species? Check one or check two? Check two, right? Okay. Um, and of course, like any other uh, branch of science or biology, um, it, in order to understand evolution, we apply the same uh, process of scientific inquiry uh, we follow the same rules, the same steps that we learned about in the very uh, beginning, right, of this course. Now, the result of evolution is the biodiversity that we observe on Earth nowadays. You know, I already told you that we have described at least one and a half million of species so far. We estimate that there are many, many more than what we uh, have just found. Uh, um, nowadays. Um, many more than that have existed on Earth. Well, I'll give you some idea of numbers later on in the course. Uh, consider all the species that have existed on Earth, but they went extinct. I was just talking about what we see nowadays. Um, and the result, the result of like something like between 3.5 and 4 billions of million, uh, billions of years of evolution. So, uh, not millions, billions, okay? It is estimated that life on Earth did appear around four uh, billions of years. You may find some textbooks that say 4.5. There is a little bit of uh, um, uncertainty in that, but a few billions for sure. And we know that um, from a fossil evidence, we know that for sure, 3.5, 3.5 to 3.2 billions of years ago, life was here because we have fossil evidence. And we'll talk about what this fossil evidence is. Believe it or not, bacteria can fossilize. Okay, we'll talk about that later on. Um, so, and remember that, um, so uh, we aim here to understand what is a, um, what has happened? What's the history uh, of life on Earth? So understanding evolution, we understand the history. We understand what happened and where we come from as well. Okay, so um, the modern theory of evolution was introduced by Charles Darwin in the 1800s. Darwin uh, came from a family of um, of scientists. His uh, father was a physician, the grandfather was a botanist, and he tried for medical school, but uh, it is narrated that he could not stand the sight of blood, so he went for natural science. He graduated when he was only 22, and he was given a position already. At that time, it was not uncommon that at a very young age uh, people become uh, professors as well. Uh, lifespan was also shorter than nowadays. And uh, uh, he actually uh, took a position, a position that uh, was on a, sh on a ship to go around the world to collect information, evidence about evolution. And he took it. Doesn't look to me like a very adventurous person from his picture, does it? But he was very adventurous. Uh, and he took a five-year voyage around the world, okay, at the age of 22, on this beagle, on this ship. And uh, um, let's see what um, he came up with. 
This is a map of wh where he, uh, he went, and especially here, the Galapagos Island was very informative to him because he found so much biodiversity there, he was blown away. Uh, he started in Britain, he was in Britain, so biodiversity, there was biodiversity, but what he found in the Galapagos Island was astonishing, especially uh, regarding species of birds, or so called, uh, so uh, famous uh, finches, the Galapagos finches. He found numerous species and he was able to, he was very systematic. If you look at his book and his notes, he would write down everything, very, very scientifically record everything. And he took with him, uh, preserved so many samples, everything he could. Um, and so, after all these um, observations, he uh, was able to understand more uh, about evolution. And he published uh, a book, uh, Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. This is a concept that he introduced. He was the first one. And it, it, it was a very modern, a very different concept uh, that anybody else had never come up with before him. Uh, evolution by natural selection. You probably already understand it because you have studied in school so much and it kind of like makes sense to you. It's kind of like, oh yeah, of course, what else could, hap could happen? But imagine when nobody knew anything about these things, how hard it was and when there was a lot of religion coming into play and talking about creationism. There were many creationists, including scientists, they were saying that all creatures on earth had been created as they are, period from some superior organism, um, superior entity, and they won't recognize any evolution. Um, so uh, the Galapagos finches, uh, many species of birds, I think he described the 13. Um, it was really important uh, uh, observations for him because he not noticed how uh, all these species were all similar. They looked alike, but they, each of them had a very specialized beak. And the beak was specialized, was uh, perfect, let's say, for the type of food that the bird species was feeding on. And so he kind of like started understanding how it must have been the food itself, the type of food itself, which in this case is the, not the selective element, the natural selective element, to determine the shape of the beak and not the other way around. It's not that the bird was born with that kind of beak. Oh, okay, uh, this is good food for me to eat. No, it's the type of food that the species was feeding on to forge that um, type of beak over the course of generations. So, um, the big shape is an, an example of, of what we call adaptation. Now, the word adaptation, you have to use it properly because in lay terminology, if I say, oh, I've adapted to the temperature of this room, I don't feel cold anymore. Adaptation refers, it's a very misleading term because it refers to something that happens now in your lifespan in, in short term. But here the word adaptation refers to changes over the course of generations in a species. Okay? So that's what the word adaptation means here in evolution. Now, uh, there were some things that were puzzling Darwin because as we will, uh, we will uh, illustrate uh, later on in the course, um, Actually, at the end of um, next time, probably we'll go over that. Um, uh, Darwin uh, observed something really amazing. Um, he found the same exact fossil of the same exact creature uh, that was no longer alive, was extinct, in very different uh, places, um, continents that were separated by ocean. How can this be possible? That was a big question mark in his head. If the theory of evolution is that he was thinking about was true, 
Evolution is independent in every place where it happens, it's different. It's so extremely unlikely that the same exact species evolves independently in two different places. It's nearly impossible, he knew that. So how could that be? And the lucky thing is that at his time, a, a book was published by uh, Charles Yells uh, uh, entitled Principles of Geology. And he took this book with him on his voyage and was reading it. And this was very enlightening because uh, this book, in this book, uh, Lias was saying that he thought that Earth has not always been shaped as we see it nowadays, and as we saw it in the 1800s and changed since then, but in very, very long uh, time, uh, much longer that was that Earth was inferred to be old at that time. Uh, Earth's crust has been shaped and reshaped, and uh, uh, likely at some point it was one piece of land. I'm sure you guys have heard about how this was named: the supercontinent Pangaea. Okay. So we know that is true now. And the movement of these Earth's crust are still happening. So it's really a dynamic thing we're, gonna, uh, we're looking at, not study. And as I told you, uh, there were many people at this time. We're challenging. We're not believing any of what all of the evidence that Darwin had collected. But Darwin didn't undergo uh, any exiliation or was not condemned. This was already a modern era, believe it or not, for science where people could publish things that weren't necessarily in agreement with the uh, Bible. But the Bible was inferring that Earth was only like a few thousand years old and creationism was a, a very broad idea uh, at that time. The other um, idea, I already told you all this, um, was the Lamarck idea, which we're going to look at uh, in a minute. So, this slide is the six commandments of this course, which means you must know. Okay, I told you. So, uh, there are four main observations and two main deductions that Darwin uh, made after his voyage. Overproduction, first observation. All species produce more of spring that will survive to adulthood. Even humans. And don't think about our society. Think about those populations of humans that live in a more primitive, less conditioned uh, state. Uh, the um, African populations, the tribes, they have lots and lots of offspring. One woman would have 20, 25. For the whole course of life, of reproductive life, she will always be pregnant. So there will be an overproduction of offspring, but unfortunately it's sad, not all the children um, live, right? Either for disease or because of resources, they don't have enough food, uh, a lot of offspring will die. So not all the offspring survives. So the principle here is that you overproduce because not all survives for many reasons. They're not all competitive, let's say. And this also implies that populations remain more or less constant in numbers, because if there was an overproduction and all the offspring would always survive, then the number will increase, okay? Uh, probably there will be an overpopulation. And of course, this is the case of human population because we have come to an era where we, uh, we can keep uh, pretty much all the offspring alive because we're able to cure disease. We're, we, we have found food for most of the developed countries that don't have any uh, resource problems. And so we're overpopulating Earth. But that's a different topic, okay? So we talk about the natural world here. Variation. All individuals in a species, the population of a species, they're all different. They have small variations. Now, Darwin didn't know anything about genetics. Uh, gene, the word gene was not out there. And um, he talked about traits. 
Okay, we talk about traits nowadays as well. We can call traits, we can call them genes, we can call them mutations, it's up to you. All of us have different mutations, okay, which may confer us different ability to survive in certain conditions, in certain environment. Whenever a certain environmental pressure comes into play, can I consider an environmental selective a factor, a virus, a pathogen, yes, or a climatic change, okay? They're all examples. So there is variation uh, among the individuals of a, 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 a population of the same species and um, adaptation. So the traits, the genes that increase the suitability to a particular environment are, go are the ones that survive in the species and are going to be passed on. Okay, so these are the four observation, observations and the two deductions. First of the deductions that he made after his observation. All organisms are involved in a species are involved for a, in a struggle for survival and only the ones that are stronger in that environment, best adapted to those conditions of the environment, will survive. And uh, the ability, the different ability of surviving and reproducing of individuals in a certain population leads to the accumulation of the favorable characters or traits or genes or mutations um, in that particular context, in that particular environment over the course of generations. So there will be a selection of traits. The selection is determined by the environment and nothing else. Okay, so these are very important concepts and for each of them, I have a little slide. Again, this you must know very well. Uh, these are examples, okay? Again, these apply, overproduction applies to all species, including human. Don't think about our modern society, okay? We're still animals, and in the primitive stage, we uh, do behave uh, the same way. Um, so, overproduction of offspring. But because not all offspring survives to adulthood, because there is a competition for resources, or some are not uh, well adapted, some individuals are not very well adapted to environment, and this is because of variation, population will remain more or less constant over time. There is a lot of variation in uh, individuals of the same species. This is a, an example of physical. You see how the pattern of the giraffes is different. Can this determine uh, differential survival, this pattern? Any ideas? predation. They're predated, these animals, right? They're predators. And so one pattern could be uh, blending uh, more versus the other and depends also in which area maybe uh, these giraffes are living. And therefore, uh, again, um, this could be an element where the selection, uh, predation is a strong uh, selective environmental uh, factor that can um, act upon a population of same species, okay? Absolutely. Uh, and remember, when we talk about charac character traits, we don't talk about just physical. Traits can be uh, just molecular, even behavioral. A behavior is a trait. Anything that is under genetic control and behaviors are un under genetic control. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some very bizarre behaviors in nature, you wonder, I wonder still nowadays, how can this be? A newborn bird hatches from its egg 
and throws out from the nest all the eggs that are there. How does he know how to do that? Eliminates the competition right away. Yes, it exists. It still blows my mind away. So, uh, anyways, anything that is under genetic control, molecular, behavioral, physical, okay, it's a character. Um, so, uh, the first deduction is that um, all organisms are involved in a struggle for survival, and some individuals are better adapted to their environment than others just by pure, pure luck, just because they had the right genetic variation. They were born with the right genetic variation, not by choice, right? And those ones are the ones that will pass on their genes because they survive and reproduce better than others. Now, talking about surviving and reproducing better, there is a word that you must also learn if you have never heard about it. I would be surprised. Fitness. Of course you have heard about fitness in the, at the gym, right? Okay, forget about that meaning. Here, fitness does not absolutely refer to strength or being fit physically. It refers to ability of reproducing. In fact, we will see examples in nature where the smaller and weaker male is the one called the sneaker male that is able to reproduce better and not the big and bulky and scary one. Okay? Sometimes it's true. The stronger will fight and they will win the mate. But sometimes it's not true. So ability to reproduce better is what we uh, indicate as fitness here. That's it. Um, now, to this regard, I want to make an example. I don't remember if we talked about sickle cell anemia in this class, did we? Briefly? No? Okay, just to, to give you an example of what being uh, fit means. So, you know, your red blood cells, um, I'm going to mute this. Okay, so your red blood cells are shaped in a biconcave shape like this, okay? And this is a very ideal shape because uh, your red blood cells are pretty flexible. Imagine your red blood cells have to go to travel through very, very tiny vessels, the capillary ones, that they are the tips of your body. And so they must be flexible. And also this shape increases the, uh, to it maximizes actually the surface of exchange of what? What do um, red blood cells transport? oxygen, okay, because there is a, a molecule in here known as hemoglobin that transports oxygen. Now, there are some people that are born with a mutation, a small, one small mutation in the hemoglobin, just one, Takes, doesn't take much to have that mutation really, and their red blood cells turn into this shape. And therefore, these red blood cells are not ideally shaped, and these people have problems. Um, now, if these people have a, uh, just partial, 50% uh, say of these cells, because maybe they have just one mutation, or we receive one chromosome from one mom and one from dad of each representative, we'll talk about that. If they have only 50% of this, they're going to be fine. They're going to live a normal life. They cannot go to the Olympics because they cannot stress their body because these red blood cells, they can actually uh, clog their capillary. Capillaries, they can actually really die. Um, so they have to be careful, but they can live a normal life and they can reproduce. Now, you go to certain places of Africa and Asia, and you find that more than 50% of people there have this anemia. When that mutation 
that determines the anemia. It's a mutation that could be, it's, it's a random mutation that can happen equal, uh, with a weak equal frequency or chance in any of us, as well as in any of those individuals of that population. So you know that there must be a reason why most people have that mutation. There has been a selection for it somehow. Why in the world some bad, I'm going to quote it, bad trait is selected for? Any ideas? Remember, selective pressure can be a pathogen, could be a virus, or could be some pathogen. Very good. So malaria, which is endemic in those areas where you find people mostly with this trait, uh, is caused by a, an organism that belongs to the kingdom protista. So it's a very small uh, creature that needs to get into your red blood cells. What it does, it gets into your blood cells, reproduces there, and uh, makes uh, the red blood cells explode because it reproduces produce so many copies of itself that the red blood cells explode. So you end up having high fevers and eventually die because uh, uh, if it's not <laughs> caught on time, there are some medications that out there that can kind of, if, if you catch it on time, cure it. But uh, in these populations where they don't have maybe much availability of those medications and you don't catch it on time, um, pretty much there's a lot of uh, death by malaria. So. Long story short, if you have this uh, bad trait that confers anemia, this pathogen cannot get into these cells. So you're immune to malaria. So what's the history? What happened there? Initially, in a population, there was equal, very few individuals maybe that had this trait just by chance. That's the same chance that any of us in this room could have it, right? A mutation. But because of the presence of the agent of malaria, that agent, that pathogen, has represented the selective pressure that has killed most of these people that were killed by malaria. And these ones were surviving and reproducing. And so over the course of generations, they passed the mutation along the new generations. And now you find the trait highly enriched in those populations. So what I want to, I guess the point that I want to make is that don't ever think uh, of the word mutation as a bad word. A mutation is a mutation, period. Is this mutation a good mutation or a bad mutation? Depends on the context. So you cannot define as good or bad or bad, okay? And so, in this case, uh, it's a trait, it's a mutation that confers better ability to survive and reproduce, okay? And so it's not always the strongest or the fittest that survives. Sometimes it's the one that has a little defect, if you will, okay? Like in that regard. So, um, okay, so that's the word fitness ability to reproduce. The people that have circle cell anemia are more fit in an environment where malaria agent is present than individuals that don't have that mutation, that trait. All right, so evolution by natural selection, that's all I have told you. Uh, that's what it means. So the environment creates a selection, a natural selection, of the individuals that are better adapted to that particular environment and the trait that uh, confer better uh, fitness uh, will be passed on, of course. Uh, all right, so that's all summarized here. Now, when Darwin uh, was uh, formulating all these uh, uh, hypothesis based on evidence and uh, publishing all this in a book very systematically. There was another uh, theory out there, Lamarckian theory, uh, formulated by Lamarck. Um, 
disagreed a lot with Darwin. Basically said the opposite. Um, Lamarck was saying that evolution happened because of traits that are acquired during the lifetime of an organism. In other words, the giraffes that were able to do this and extend their neck to get uh, leaves that are on uh, top of the trees, are the, they were kind of elongating their neck during their lifespan. And that elongated neck was being somehow passed on. Is that true? In other words, it's like saying, I get a tattoo and my kid is born with a tattoo. It's the same concept. It's something that happens during my lifespan, a modification. Or I get a crisis surgery nose and, my, and I pass it on my kid. Doesn't happen, you know. That doesn't happen that way, right? But you know it because you have already kind of been imprinted with all this concept in school. But at that time, it was not that obvious. Okay, People didn't know how this transmission of characters would happen. There is also another theory that Lamarck was stating. It was uh, <laughs> stating the theory of uh, use and disuse, uh, which was saying that if you don't use some structures, this could be lost um, uh, in the next generations. Or if you use them, they will be passed on. Well, that's another strange theory. I don't really understand it, but that's what he was saying. And of course, because I know what the truth is. Uh, okay, so this is all not true, but uh, you know that this is what uh, um, many people were following. It's kind of theory. Okay, and it, it took a while for people, for the scientific community to come on board and, uh, and uh, accept uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. All right, here come like something very fun. I'm gonna show you a couple of videos today that are gonna blow your mind away. Um, there is a special case of natural selection. It's quite bizarre. It's known as sexual selection. It kind of goes against, in a way, the principles that we talked about. Because most of the time, natural selection favors those individuals that have characters that confer them better viability, right? Uh, better um, uh, compet uh, competition factors in the environment, or better, better um, yeah, um, if we're talking about predation being one of the major environmental pressure, if uh, the individuals in a population that can escape better the predators or faster, they may be the ones that um, are uh, survive and reproduce better. Um, sometimes males of, in some species, males of a certain species evolve very extreme characters, traits, such as a very big tail, very elaborated. And that's all to impress a female. To the expense of maybe uh, being uh, weaker because of that character, okay? Or, for instance, be more susceptible to a predator because a long tail could pr uh, represent uh, something that slows you in a run, right? And so, um, this is at the, uh, the, pay, the payoff here, though, is that this individual that has this trait will be chosen by sexual selection by a female to reproduce. Um, okay, so we're gonna watch first the first video, which is the tale of peacock. This is a very important video, and it talks about a little experiment that they have done in order to understand the concept that I just told you about. So pay attention to this one. Second one is really fun video. We just have enough time to watch these videos, okay? So pay attention. I'm sorry, this is not the one that I wanted to show you first. I want to show you first the, the Taylor Peacock one. Yeah, that's the second one, sorry. It's 
pay attention to this. Mm-hmm. 